Again, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house this evening. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Hebrews 12 with me? Hebrews chapter 12. And this evening, continuing in the book of Hebrews together, um, I'd like us to begin now, and as the text is leading us to begin, I'd like us to see two examples beginning this week and next week, of unbelief. Uh, We saw in the the past couple of months, more than a couple of months, we saw in chapter 11 and beginning in chapter 12 of Hebrews, we saw all of these examples of faith that were given to us. We we saw the, the faith of an individual through the things that they did. But here, Hebrews is going to give us a warning. It's going to warn us against unbelief by the example of, by two examples in the Old Testament. Tonight we'll be looking at the example of Esau, and next week we'll be looking at the example of Israel in the wilderness. And so if you have your Bibles in Hebrews 12, we'll begin reading in verse 14 together. The scripture says, Follow peace with all men. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how the afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing... He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And now let's go to our Lord together in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again and we thank you for the words that you've given to us. Lord, even for the warnings of the scripture. Lord, as harsh warnings they are, uh, nonetheless we know that if we will heed them, Lord, if we will turn from them to look in Jesus Christ, to have faith in him, Lord, we know that we have uh, everlasting life and blessing in him. Lord, we pray that there's none of us among us here tonight uh, who is a profane person or a fornicator. Uh, Lord, uh, that there's none who uh, do not have the grace of Christ Jesus upon them. Uh, Lord, we pray that if there are any among us, that you would draw them to be saved. Lord, we ask that you'd be with those who can make it to worship with us tonight. And Lord, that you'd help them to Uh, remember Christ, Lord, remember his sufferings uh, on the cross, and Lord, we ask that you would persevere them in the faith until the day of Christ. Uh, We pray you'd be with our missionaries and our representatives as we always pray, and Lord, for our own selves, we ask that you would help us to abstain from sins and to be useful to you this week. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray, amen. So here, beginning in our passage, We read that we have a duty to uh, look to the things of our church. We have a duty to guard the church. This is something we've been talking about all throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, One theme in the book of Hebrews over and over again that's brought up is that we as believers have a duty to watch out for one another. And particularly to watch out for one another's souls. We read in verse 14 last week, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We've been looking at the discipline that God exerts towards his children, that that he disciplines them in order to bring them into the way that he desires for them to go. And we saw that when it says that we ought to follow peace with all men, and holiness, that part of what this means is getting along well in the church and doing the work of the church, doing the holy work of the church that's been delivered to us. We, as a priesthood of believers, are to keep the work of the church as it's been delivered us from God. We need to continue that work, especially in evangelism and in caring for our own. And in doing this, we see that we have an obligation towards one another as a congregation to watch out for one another. In verse 15 it says, looking diligently. 
lest any man fail of the grace of God. It says we ought to watch out. We ought to look diligently. We ought to, we ought to search out as if, uh, again, as if our lives depended on it, lest any man fail of the grace of God. We, we are called on to watch out for each other's souls, to look at one another, to examine the lives of each other, lest any one of us fail of the grace of God, lest in the last day any one of us be found a hypocrite, be found reprobate, be condemned everlastingly. We each have been given a charge over the souls of the people that we interact with here, the people that we work with uh, and worship with. We've been, we've been given a charge over one another. Back in Hebrews 10 and verse 24, we read something similar. It says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Part of the reason that we're to gather diligently, that we're to exhort one another to good works, and, and, and so much the more as the, the judgment of Christ comes to the earth, one of the reasons for all that is because if we sin willfully against the gospel, if, if we disbelieve the gospel, any one of us, then there remains no more sacrifice for sin. There's no other gospel. There's no other savior that can save those of us who might disbelieve the gospel. And so we're to look diligently. We're to watch out ju just like a guard on a wall. Just like a, a, a military guard on a wall, guarding the encampment, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And specifically, we're, it, the passage tells us a few things we're to watch for. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. This is a reference to the Old Testament. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. It's from Deuteronomy 29 and verse 18, where the scripture says, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. There's that quote. And it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. It says that here in uh, Deuteronomy, the situation was that they were to teach each other the law diligently. They, they were to remind each other of the promises of God diligently, lest this root of bitterness spring up this root that bears bad fruit this root that bears bitterness and gall and wormwood lest it spring up and this this man this woman sins and when they hear the condemnation of god's law they turn to themselves and they bless themselves they turn away from god they will not come to him for salvation they go to the gods of the nations, which are easy to be entreated. They will not rather come to Jesus Christ and be saved. And so, it says that we ought to watch, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness spring up, and more than just spring up among us. In verse 15, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be 
defiled. So first, the man that we read about, he, he, he sprouts up in the church. He bears bad fruit in the church, obvious bad fruit in the church. And in doing that, he defiles the people around him. Uh, this is either first by his own person. He himself is defiled. Um, the, the, Titus chapter 1 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But unto the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. So he himself is defiled. But also that the church is defiled by him. When he springs up, when, when his uh, faithlessness is made known, then the church is defiled. Its testimony is ruined. And even more than that, many might follow after them. In 2 Peter 2, verse 2, it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by, way of whom the, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The, the, it says that a man who has no faith in the church a man who does not believe in the gospel in the church and bears the fruit of his unbelief in the church, that he defiles the testimony of the church and he draws many after him. Many are defiled by following him instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of trusting in Christ's gospel, they follow after the works of wickedness of this man. And as an example of this kind of, of person we're given two examples in the following verses first we're given the example of Esau and then we're given the example of the Israelites in the wilderness and tonight we'll look at Esau in verse 16 our passage says lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright here we have um, course uh, Esau mentioned and how he sold his birthright uh, the story of this is in Genesis 25 and verse 29 and if you'd like to uh, you can turn there for a moment but as you're turning I'll explain uh, briefly what's meant by any fornicator or profane person these are just two kinds of examples of course a fornicator is one who uh, engages in sexual relations outside of marriage and a profane person is what Esau was a profane or an earthly kind of person a man who is after the earth who who loves the things of this world as we see Esau did in Genesis 25 in verse 29 we read that Jacob sawed pottage he cooked pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In this, Esau came in from the field. He had been working and he was hungry. And he asked Jacob to give him some of the food that he was making. And Jacob bought the birthright from Esau for a bowl of of soup and even the name Edom the nation that came from Esau's uh, lineage is named for this exact event when he when he came in from the field and he was red from the heat and he wanted the uh, he wanted the bowl of lentils uh, therefore um, he the, the, his nation was called Edom but anyway uh, it says that Esau hated his birthright he despised it when he sold it to Jacob. What were the benefits that this birthright gave to him? In Genesis 25, 32, again it says, Esau said, Behold, I am the, at the point to die, 
And what profit shall this birthright do to me? He questioned what his possession in the Lord would benefit him. What, what good was it to Esau if he came in uh, and, uh, and didn't get the bowl of soup? Esau's birthright was of great value to him. If he had had the birthright, if he had retained it, he would have had the honor of the birthright. In Psalms 89 and verse 27, it says, Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. If Esau had retained his birthright, his right as the firstborn, then God's covenant would have abode with him and his children. If he had kept the birthright also, the good blessing of his father would have been given to him. Later in his life, uh, Jacob stole the blessing that Isaac would have given to Esau from him. The good blessing from his father Isaac. In Genesis 27, 28, it says, Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. The good blessing of the Lord came with the birthright. The, 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 the good blessing of Isaac came with the birthright. Uh, Esau sold his right to this blessing. He, he sold his right to the blessing of the firstborn to Jacob, again for a bowl of soup. He despised his birthright. And the promise of God himself would have also been given to him, or might also have been given to him, if he had not despised his birthright. The promise that God had given to Abraham would have been through Esau. In Romans 9 verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever? Amen. They were called Israelites because they were of the seed of Israel, that is of Jacob, not of Edom, not of Esau. And so Esau gave up being a patriarch in the church, being a patriarch of the old covenant people of God and a patriarch of Christ himself. He gave that up when he sold his birthright. And so his birthright was of great value. What good does the birthright do Esau if he died? Well, it would have done him all the world of good. Now, I'd like to mention quickly that as Christians and as a church here, we have a birthright in Christ. We have the right of adoption as children. In Romans 8, 15, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are not uh, just made uh, children of our physical fathers, of, of some great physical lineage, but we're made children of God by adoption. He's taken us into his family. That is our birthright as a church, as a people. It's ours. Uh, I spoke, was speaking with a... Um, with a man who has an adopted son this week. And I thought that something he told to me was, was uh, really precious and, and, and beautiful. Uh, he told me about how he's been teaching his, his adopted son recently about the peculiar love that he has towards him. That the love he has towards his adopted son is greater than if he had even been his physical son. And the reason for that is because he chose his son. It's because he chose that adopted son out of all the other children that were presented to him. He chose him specifically. And we as Christians have 
this love put on us, that God has chosen to adopt us, though he didn't need to adopt us and bring us into his family at all. It was all of grace that he brought us into his household. As Christians and as a church, we also have every blessing given to us from God. James 1.16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us by the word of his truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It says that every good gift that God has given to us, he's given to us all of grace again. And he's given it to us uh, by his choice of us. But it's, that's part of the, 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 the birthright that he's given to us as Christians by begetting us again is every good blessing that we enjoy in this place together. By, being, by bringing us into his family, by adopting us into his family. He's given us this birthright to enjoy every blessing that he's given to us, every encouragement that we hear in this place, every song that we sing together, every passage of scripture that we read and exhort one another by. He's given it to us as a good and gracious gift to be our birthright. And we also as Christians have the reality of Christ always with us. In Matthew 28 in verse 20, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Christ is always with us. Christ has been with us today in worship. And so our, just a few elements of our birthright as Christians uh, are mentioned here. We have a birthright as well as, as believers in this, in this congregation. But let's see how Esau despised his birthright. All of the goodness of his heritage, everything he sold for one meal. He sold for a single bowl of pottage, a single bowl of beans Esau sold his birthright for. And it's in this way that our passage says Esau was a profane and earthly man. The thing he sold his birthright for was an earthly thing. It was base. In 1 Corinthians 6, 3, it says meat for the belly and the belly for meats. He says that's what it's made for, meat for the belly and the belly for meats. It's, it's just food. But God shall be, destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He, he sold his birthright, again, just for a single meal, J just to fill his belly one time. He sold all his birthright. He sold his birthright for something temporary. That single meal didn't last him the rest of the week. It didn't last him the rest of his life. It lasted him a single meal, a single day. In Matthew 15, 17, it says, Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast into the draught? The food that we eat, we flush down the toilet. Uh, he, he, he gave up his birthright for something that would literally become sewage. That's what Esau gave up, all of the blessing that he might have had for nothing. And even worse, he gave up his birthright for something unnecessary. We know in Genesis that it was promised to Rebekah that two nations would come forth from her womb. And in Genesis 27, verse 28, we read about the blessing that Esau would have had as the firstborn. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. The Lord would have sustained him. Esau wouldn't have died that day. It's doubtful whether he was even at the brink of death if he could negotiate for his birthright to his brother. But it was an unnecessary exchange. It was something unnecessary he gave up his birthright for. And would we as a church do the same or have someone among us who would do the same? Would we sell our own souls 
for uh, a larger membership, uh, for any kind of worldly comforts, for uh, anything in the world? Would we sell our own souls for those things? Or would we sell the souls of our membership for those things, the souls of our fellow church members here? Would we sell for a bowl of soup? Um, what does our passage say that we ought to look for? It says in verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Are we willing to remove the profane person from among us? If there is a root of bitterness that springs up among us in the future, are we willing to put them out of the church? We're still partly talking about the discipline of the Lord towards his people. He says we ought to look out for that profane person. We ought to watch out because one profane person in the church springing up defiles many in the church. Would we sell the souls of those that sit next to us tonight, those that sing with us tonight? Would we sell their souls for the sake of one profane person among the congregation? Um, for one covetous person. Uh, we could say that's what a profane person is here. Esau, because of his profanity, was rejected. In verse 17, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully, with tears. Esau was ultimately rejected, not by men, not before the eyes of men, but before the eyes of God. Esau was rejected from having the blessing. In Romans 9, 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The Lord hated Esau as a nation. The Lord hated Esau for despising his birthright. So, so too is an unbelieving soul, though he might be among the church, rejected of God. He came into the church. He, he enjoyed the company of the church. He heard the gospel and had a right to come and believe on the gospel. The Lord gave it to him by his invitation towards him. And yet he sold it. He, he despised the birthright by rejecting the gospel. Esau could not find a space of repentance when he was rejected, though he sought it with tears, it says. In Genesis 27, 34, the consequences of Esau's sin were realized. It says, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. The blessing was taken from Esau and given to Jacob because, ja because Esau despised his birthright. It was too late for for anything then. He, he had forgone the time when he might have repented. He, he had forgone the time when he might have turned from that sin when he came into the tent and Jacob was cooking pottage. He gave up his opportunity of repentance. And so it was over. There was no taking back his blessing. We know also that a church is in peril of being rejected, which does not watch for this root of bitterness among them. In Revelation 2 and verse 14, Christ says, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who 
taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. That sounds like a profane and fornicating man. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This church was under threat of being rejected as an institution, as a congregation, because they had them that held the doctrine of Balaam. They had a root of bitterness spring up. They had someone troubling and drawing away the people of God towards idolatry. And so a church is in peril of being rejected as Esau was rejected, which does not watch out, which does not look for that root of bitterness, lest it ever come up among them. And so believers tonight, we have, of course, an exhortation here. And we have a twofold exhortation. We've seen before in the book of Hebrews how we ought to watch out for our own souls. How we ought to watch out lest we have profanity in our heart. Lest we be, uh, lest we be debased and think of earthly things and desire them before Jesus Christ. But we also have tonight a warning as a church that we should always watch out lest there be an unbeliever among us, lest there be someone who is not trusted in Jesus Christ, lest they have a root of bitterness in their heart, and they be covetous, and they sell their birthright for a bowl of soup, and they draw many after them in their pernicious ways. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This is a corporate effort. This is not just something that the pastor does. This is not just something that the deacon does. But this is to all the church, that we watch out for one another, that we care for each other's souls. If we do not care for each other's souls, if we do not have uh, love in, in our hearts towards one another, to watch out lest there be a heart of unbelief among us, then we ought to examine ourselves first to see whether we're in the faith. We ought to watch for each other's souls, believers. And now there's an unbeliever here tonight. I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1 to you. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The time of repentance is not over for you yet. The time when you might be saved will not be over until you draw your last breath. You may still believe in Jesus Christ tonight. You still have his invitation towards you. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none like me. You may still be saved tonight. It was too late for Esau to have the blessing when he returned from the hunt to his father Isaac. But it's not too late for you. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Come and believe on him and be saved before his wrath comes and takes you away. Hebrews 7, uh, 3 and verse 7 says, Wherefore as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And so today, do not harden your hearts against the gospel. Do not turn away from it, but trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. And, and again, believers, let's watch for each other's soul. Let's be sure of one another, as we've seen so many times in Hebrews, that we are believers, that we are a genuine church. Let's watch, lest any among us finally be rejected on the last day.
Now let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you again and we thank you for Christ. Lord, we thank you that, uh, Lord, he gave us grace to bring us until the day that he would save us. And Lord, we thank you that he's given uh, everyone here uh, a common grace at the very least. Uh, Lord, that he's sustained them. Lord, that they're still alive and breathing today. And Lord, that there's still the gospel being extended to them by your scripture, Lord. Lord, we ask that if there are any lost here with us tonight, Lord, that you would show them what the gospel is. Lord, that it's Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Lord, who fulfilled all of your law on the behalf of sinners. Lord, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, we ask that you would turn their hearts to him. And Lord, that they would be eternally saved. Again, be with those who couldn't make it to worship with us tonight and keep them safe and bring them back to us. The Lord, help us to be good stewards of them and to everyone here. The Lord, to watch for each other's souls. The Lord, help us to be loving about it and not, uh, Lord, uh, ruling over one another with a hard hand, but, uh, Lord, simply um, caring about one another, caring for each other's salvation. Lord, we pray that you would keep us all safe on our way home and that you'd bring us back to worship again. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.